I'm up here on Oregon's Mount Hood, 11,235 foot peak, and we're at a place called Enid Lake. Enid Lake is a pristine area that not only has the beauty of nature, but it has the heritage of the Oregon Trail pioneers. This was a place where the overland immigrants licked their wounds. They thought they had come over 2,000 miles and the worst was over, but it wasn't. They were here to regroup, patch their wagons back together, and as far as they knew, there were, they were heading now for the Willamette Valley to start a whole new life. But what they didn't realize, just up ahead a few short miles, was the most infamous place in all of the 2,000 plus mile Oregon Trail. A place that would send terror through their bodies and their minds. A place called Big Laurel Hill. I'd like to take you with me now on a journey through time. It only represents a few short miles, actually, but to the overland immigrants, it represented life or death. If they failed here, they would not make it to their destination, to the New Eden, the place they call the Willamette Valley. We're gonna scale the cliffs of Big Laurel Hill, walk the same trails that they did over to the edge, peer down, and visualize what it was like when they lowered their wagons with fragile ropes down these steep cliffs. We're gonna to journey to the bottom of the rugged zigzag canyon, fight our way through along the, the stream called Camp Creek, and walk through what seemed to be like bottomless swamps. And finally, to Tollgate, a place where the survivors had the privilege of paying for what they had just endured. The Oregon Trail over Mount Hood was known as the Barlow Trail. It was named after Samuel Kimbrough Barlow. Barlow was 55 years old when he crossed the Oregon Trail with his family and seven wagons and landed at the Dalles in September of 1845. Barlow learned to raft his wagons down the Columbia River was going to cost him $50 each. Barlow thought this was highway robbery and so he began to inquire amongst the locals and talked to the mountain men, learning everything he could about that area, wondering if there wasn't a way to get wagons over the Cascade Mountains. His only big obstacle was Mount Hood. They say he stood in the streets of the Dalles and he boasted that God never made a mountain, that he didn't make a way for a person to go over or around it, and he was gonna find that way. And so families flocked and joined Barlow, and they began to push on over the mountains. Well, crossing Mount Hood was not an easy task. They found that cutting down a few trees was mighty tough. And so they even tried burning the forest down, but it was too wet. The winter set in and they were in trouble. So they crudely constructed a log cabin, stuffed everything they could inside, and they hiked out. Barlow and a man named William Rector went on ahead. Their goal was to reach the Willamette Valley, secure some food, and then bring the food back to these immigrants who were still on the mountains. And Barlow, being a man of opportunity, decided heading back into the mountains with food was not his calling. Instead, he sent William Rector and another man back, and he hightailed it to the first provisional government of Oregon. And there he convinced them to give him a charter to build the first toll road over the Cascade Mountain. By the time the last person struggled into Oregon City barely alive, Barlow not only had his charter, but his money. And it was Christmas Day. In the spring of 1846, with the snow having just barely melted from the trails, the wagons that they had cached in the mountains along with all their supplies were not even out. But Barlow had built himself a toll gate and he was charging five dollars per wagon that wanted to cross over his so-called wagon road. But it was no road. Barlow, as time went on, became the most hated man in Oregon because not only did the immigrants crossing the trail have to cut trees out of their way and remove slides, but they also had to lower their wagons down steep, dangerous cliffs, the cliffs of Big Laurel Hill. 
A lot of them, however, had a third choice. A man that looked like Uncle Sam. His name was Samuel Welch. Now Samuel Welch had come over the Oregon Trail in the early 1840s, and he fell in love with Mount Hood. And he moved up here and he began guiding wagons over Big Laurel Hill. Samuel made a lot of money, but he told the immigrants, you don't have to keep coming down this terrible, terrible cliff. A short distance away, less than a quarter of a mile, was an easy trail. There were no wagon chutes, but the immigrants wouldn't listen to him, for they had read all those flyers that were handed off at the jumping off places, warning them, do not take any shortcuts. Those routes would be surely be the worst, and you would die. Oral histories, however, of the Cascade tribe and the Clackamas Indians claim that these wagon chutes the immigrants were utilizing, all 13 of them, were vision quest sites. These were places where young men or women went to seek their spirit power. Samuel Barlow decided to send the wagons over these cliffs and destroy these religious sites, and that he did. If you can imagine how many people died Wagons destroyed, possessions lost, people injured, and for what? Nothing but politics. From Enid Lake, the trail headed westward. When it reached this point, this was a junction where three different trails came together. It was at this point where people had to make up their minds. They had to be smart or they had to be foolish. Those that were foolish continued on toward the wagon chute with a full wagon. Most people, however, had been trail hardened. They had struggled through some of the worst imaginable conditions that the Oregon Trail had to offer them, and they knew what they were doing. They unloaded their wagons, and they hand carried all their possessions down this narrow, steep trail. They drove their livestock behind it, except for one, which they left hitched to their wagon. Once everything was down at the bottom, this sole animal, whether it was a oxen, a mule, a horse, and sometimes only a dairy cow, for that's all they had left, pulled that empty wagon to the top of the wagon chute. I'm standing now at the top of one of the wagon chutes, right at the launching pad. Imagine this place covered with snow. That was the time of year when people were really coming through. It was miserable. When the wagon reached this point, they turned around backwards. They tied a rope onto the front axle. Now that rope wasn't anything that they had brought with them. By this point in their journey, all their rope was worn out. And so they had to make do with what they could find to make this rope. And that was the hides off of dead animals. You see, so many of their animals, cattle, oxen, horses, mules, were starving. And the only thing they could find that was green and growing was the poison leaves of the rhododendron plants. So the immigrants pulled the hides off those animals and they made two sections of this green hide rope. And they called it green hide because they didn't have time to let it cure. The snow was coming down and their lives were in jeopardy. Their goal was to get off a of big Laurel Hill as fast as they could. Once they had made their green hide rope, they signed a group to man the ropes. They would snub the ropes around a tree like this one, or they used a block and tackle. But before they could lower it down over this cliff, they needed some other people to help them. There was a man who walked on the ground with a stick and his job was to fool with the wheels and move rocks and do whatever was needed on that ground. Another man stood on the outside of the wagon on the brake shoe. These brake shoes were wooden and didn't catch very good. And his job was to not only hold on tight, but to make sure that brake caught. The third person, probably the most important, was the man who rode inside the wagon, holding on to the brake. He was called the man who rides the tornado. You see, if anything happened, the man on the ground could always step aside. The man on the outside of the wagon could jump free. But the man who was inside had to ride this wagon all the way down to the bottom. 
That's why they called him the man who rides the tornado. Unable to go any further, the immigrants had to stop and rest. Their wagons were falling apart. Some people were injured. Others, they didn't know if they were alive or dead. And so they discovered a beautiful little stream at the bottom of the canyon, which for all practical purposes, they called Camp Creek. Here they rested, and then they went on. The immigrants were greeted with nothing more than more thick timbers, thick undergrowth, and a terrible stretch of wetlands that spanned Camp Creek. Wagons bogged down, people sunk into the mud which they swore was quicksand. Finally, however, as years passed, Barlow threw some logs down and built what they called the Corduroy Road. Corduroy was logs that were laid over wetlands and the wagons traveled a very bumpy, bumpy ride. We have now finally reached Tollgate. This was a little village in the trail, and in order to get through the gates, you had to pay $5. To most of the immigrants, the cost of $5 a wagon for the privilege of having traveled through hell wasn't worth it. They tried to bypass the gate, and if they were caught, they were actually apprehended, thrown into jail, which was located at Tollgate, and then charged double. The gatekeepers would also take watches, jewelry, rings, anything of value. If they didn't have that, the gatekeeper sent them east. Well, the immigrants couldn't get very far because Big Laurel Hill was right above them. So they would stop and go back to the toll gate and beg that toll gate keeper to let them through and they tried to barter with the furniture that they had hauled over the trail. Now, one of the more interesting gatekeepers is Daniel Parker. When Daniel Parker first started working at the toll gate, he was a bachelor, but he didn't stay that way very long. He fell in love with one of the pioneer women traveling through and after only two days, asked her for her hand in marriage, but they were faced with a dilemma. The nearest church was over 20 miles away in the town of Sandy and Daniel couldn't shut down the gate just to get married. And so he did the next best thing. He built himself a little chapel and he sent for the preacher, and the preacher married him and his bride right there at Tollgate. A few years later, when they had kids, that little chapel became the first schoolhouse that his kids attended. Now, Daniel was the kind of man who, who loved beauty, and he looked at the Tollgate, and he thought that this would never do. It was just a plain, ordinary gate. So he went out in the woods and dug two saplings, they were big leaf maple saplings. And he planted those little tiny trees on both sides of the gate. And over 110 years later, those trees are still surviving. Tollgate was more than just a gate out in the middle of a trail. It was a village. It was an impressive place. It had a cluster of buildings that included a blacksmith shop, a wheelwright, even had a bunkhouse where people could rent themselves a bed. Imagine, after traveling over five to six months on the Oregon Trail, finally, at least for one night, you could sleep in a real bed. You could also buy yourself a hot bath. Most immigrants hadn't experienced the hot bath ever since they left the jumping off places in the Missouri River country. They had to bathe in the cold, icy streams that they found along the way. But probably one of the most important buildings that was located at Tollgate was the trading post. Here you could buy just about whatever you wanted, but at inflated prices. Some of the immigrants, for example, could even buy back the same items that they had traded to get through the gate because they had no money. Take, for example, these items here. Dishes like these were packed in beans or rice, corn meal, hauled over the trail, going through all of that misery just to get to this gate 
and having to trade it to the gatekeeper if they expected to get through and make it to the Willamette Valley. Imagine the feeling of helplessness to have come over Mount Hood expecting that you were really going to be on a toll road, only to find out that this was nothing more than an Indian trail that had been widened in a few spots and unimproved in most of it. When they reached the gate, there was no choice. They couldn't go back. They just had to go ahead and sacrifice what little they had left. The next time you're in the mountains, in the forest, or even out in the desert, and you stumble across the remnants of an old trail, ask yourself, could I be walking on the same path as those who stepped into history? Maybe, just maybe.